A community demanding answers in Grays Harbor County after the parents of a missing girl are locked up, refusing to help bring her home. Now the spotlight examines their sociopathic behavior. They're not crying, they're not, they're not passionate about trying to find Oakley. Plus, did social workers ignore phone calls warning that Oakley Carlson was being abused? Why can't you tell us whether an agent went and talked to the family? Uh or tested the family. Our investigation into the agency, tasked with protecting children, reveals a workplace culture of fear. There's no way to do that job 100% correct. As the foster mother, who loved Oakley like her own, holds on to hope. My mama heart wants to believe that she is alive out there. Hello, I'm David Rose on location with the spotlight in Montecito, asking the question that everybody wants to know. Where is little five-year-old Oakley Carlson? Take a look at these photos here. Burn her face into your memory. This gorgeous little girl, last seen February 10th of 2021. The community rallying together, offering more than $25,000 for tips to help find her. Meanwhile, her father, Andrew Carlson, is sitting in the Grays Harbor County Jail behind me, but he's getting out on August 3rd. And the first thing he'll see are these photos of his missing daughter. It's a picture filled with promise. Andrew Carlson and Jordan Bowers in early 2016. Six years later, the parents at the center of the investigation into the chilling disappearance of their five-year-old daughter, now sitting in separate cells. I haven't done a lot of things correctly in the last seven years or so. Andrew and Jordan both locked up after pleading guilty to child endangerment. They admitted to exposing Oakley's sister and little brother to meth. Jordan serving a 20 month sentence at the women's prison in Purdy. Andrew sentenced to a year in jail, but set for early release this summer. Neither has been charged in the disappearance of Oakley, last seen alive on February 10th, 2021. Our goal is to find Oakley. Unfortunately, that might not be alive. It might be, you know, we're doing remains, but we need to find her to move forward. Detectives are getting no help from either parent, says Chief Investigator Darren Wallace with the Grays Harbor County Sheriff's Office. They're not crying. They're not, they're not passionate about trying to find Oakley. It's um, very vague answers and, and very nonchalant answers with us. The couple first met when Andrew was an Aberdeen police officer, then a monumental fall from grace. He lost his badge and commission in 2017 for making false and misleading statements. His relationship with Jordan described as volatile, fueled by meth. Court documents showing Andrew was the more responsible parent to the three kids they shared, while Jordan was out hitting the slots and the pipe. Her first love in life is to gamble. Would she befriend, say, men or older men at the casino or strangers? All the above to get money, for sure. Who was keeping the kids when she was there? Andrew was at home most of the time when she was gone. Though she was usually hanging around druggies, detectives say there's no evidence that Oakley was sold off or trafficked. Have you been able to connect with the people that were selling them drugs? And do those people know anything? We've talked to people that sold them drugs, used drugs with them. All were cooperative, but they still want to speak with anyone associated with Jordan from last February to December 6th, the day Oakley's missing persons report was filed. It's sometimes those little pieces of evidence or uh, comments that someone may have said that puts the piece together and is like, oh, there it is. In 2017, Oakley was taken away from her biological parents when she was about seven months old and sent to live with Eric and Jamie Jo Hiles. Jamie Jo telling the spotlight she and her husband instantly fell in love with a little girl with the precious smile. She just had such a good impact and it was such a, a good learning experience. Things that maybe I didn't think would be difficult were really difficult, but the memories and like the joy that she brought us was just like, it's immeasurable. The family's house in Elma is filled with photos of Oakley. During their time fostering her, Jamie Jo says she became concerned about Oakley's safety after Oakley returned from seeing her biological parents, Andrew Carlson and Jordan Bowers. She contacted the Washington State Department of Children, Youth and Families, the agency that oversees foster families and child protective services. When Oakley would come home from a, a visit and say that she saw somebody hit somebody, between their parents um, and they felt no concerns, like that's a real concern to me. That's a really big concern to me and I felt like it was just kind of brushed off. Then in 2019, right before Oakley turned three years old, the state returned her to her biological parents. I was looking at an email um, several days ago from the social worker where she just told me um, she'll be back on the 29th of November. And that's all I was told. She'll be picked up at 10 a.m. Have her stuff ready. 
Jamie Jo doesn't believe Jordan or Andrew ever had the best interest of Oakley or her sister in mind when they petitioned the courts to return the children. It was a game to them. It wasn't that they wanted their kids to love them. It was because they wanted to win. They wanted to win in the court system and they wanted to win just because they, that's what they wanted. They wanted to win. Jamie Jo raised this little girl. She saw her first steps, heard her first words, and she was so worried about her safety. She begged them not to take her away. Communities like Oakville are small, as you can see from our drone footage. People here know each other, and word gets around quickly. She heard that Oakley wasn't doing well. The reason I called in January of 2021 was because I had been told through like several other people that she looked like she had black eyes at Christmas, at tw Christmas of 2020s. I said that I had seen a photo and I had also heard that there was abuse and that she looked unwell. Um, in December of 2020 and that I was very worried and um, I would love to hear a recording of that call because I'm pretty sure I remember the gentleman saying that I could get in trouble for making false accusations. It's unclear what happened after her call to DCYF. It appears by that point that Andrew and Jordan were no longer required to undergo drug tests administered by DCYF. The last known sighting of Oakley occurred two weeks after that phone call on February 10th 2021. That's when the Grays Harbor County Sheriff's Office says someone associated with the family saw Oakley. Nine months later, on November 6, 2021, Andrew Carlson made a phone call to 911 from the property that sits at the end of this road, the house now guarded by a gate that's padlocked with a no trespassing sign. He told the operator that his daughter started a fire by putting a lighter to the couch, saying his daughter was four years old. Well, Oakley was four years old at that time. Later, fire investigators determined that that fire actually started in the microwave. So that story was not true. Add to that that this home is about 10 miles from Oakville. In fact, if you take a look at our spotlight drone footage, you'll see it's about a quarter mile from any of his nearest neighbors. We couldn't see anybody home. We saw the barn, we saw the main house, but no vehicles on the property. The entire situation seemed really bizarre to Jamie Jo. So again, worried about Oakley's safety, she called DCYF. I was on hold at first for about 45, 50 minutes, and my phone call lasted a total of probably five to 10 minutes. And it was very much, um, I'm worried about this. I know that there's neglect in this family. I know that there's drug use. Um, I'm very concerned. Fire investigators visited the house after the fire and determined that it was started in the microwave not the couch. After the fire, the Carlson family was staying at a motel in Tumwater. Oakville elementary principal and family friend Jessica Swift told police that she was in contact with them almost every day, offering support and supplies. But she said she never saw Oakley and became concerned. Then in December, Oakley's six-year-old sister had a sleepover at Swift's house. Swift asked her about Oakley, and the child got upset and said, Oakley is no more. When directly asked, she told Swift that her mother told her not to talk about Oakley because she had gone out to be eaten by wolves. That's when Swift called the Grace Harbor County Sheriff's Office requesting a welfare check. Tumwater police officers made contact with Jordan and Andrew at the hotel. They lied saying that Oakley was with her grandparents. They were arrested for investigation of manslaughter, but were never actually charged with that crime. Since then, the Grace Harbor County Sheriff, State Patrol and FBI have all searched for Oakley. What are the biggest challenges to trying to find her, given the terrain we're dealing with? Yeah, so you've been out in the woods in, this, in, this, in these areas. It's not an open wooded, uh, you can just walk through, you know, there's blackberry bushes, briar patches, all that type of stuff. So it's really a lot of underbrush. Uh, you can't just walk through the woods and look for, for uh, a five-year-old girl. Um, you know, it's very difficult, and very strenuous, and it takes a lot of labor to do it. Where is Oakley? Almost every weekend, protesters gathered outside the jail chanting, demanding answers from Oakley's biological parents. But my mama heart wants to believe that she is alive out there. But Jamie Jo knows there's a good chance that that's not true. She might be dead. She might be somewhere across the United States. She might be in another country. She could be experiencing trauma. She says as much as she and her husband Eric loved being parents, she's done with the foster care system in our state. I will never, ever foster another child. And that's what's sad is that I know that there are children that need homes. and. I know my husband and I were amazing foster parents, um, but I could never ever work with DCYF or another foster system again when it's as broken as it is. 
I know though that what's going to happen and I hope what's going to happen is when um, people request freedom of information they're going to find out some stuff that is really going to um, make DCYF look horrible. Really bad. The Spotlight filed a public disclosure request for records related to Oakley's case. Specifically, we wanted to know who visited Oakley to see if she was okay. Were any calls made to DCYF? And if so, who took those intake calls? And what was done about them? Were any investigations opened on the case? Essentially, who was looking out for Oakley? Had anybody gone to check on her or to make sure that her parents weren't using drugs? And here's the response that we got from DCYF. Basically, it says, denied. Let me tell you exactly in the legal terms what they said here. It said that the state agency under federal and state law is exempt from disclosure under the Public Records Act. DCYF client records may be released with a court order or written waiver of confidentiality executed by the parent, child, and or legal guardian. If you disagree with this denial, you may request for a review by writing to Jody Arndt. You know what, Jody? I disagree. I disagree strongly with that request. And that's because in the past, we've sent your office other requests for public documents, including a case in Whatcom County involving a little girl who died there. And in that request, we got all kinds of documents. You redacted the medical records and all of the other sensitive information, but it gave us a timeline of what was done on the case. This time, when it comes to Oakley, there's no information. We have been cut out completely, which means the public has been cut out completely. Law enforcement has been cut out completely. What are you hiding? Did DCYF monitor Oakley? Were her parents tested for drugs? It's a simple question. We're just trying to find out what happened to this little girl and who's accountable. We didn't stop there. We went right to the top. When I come back, I'm going to talk to the head of DCYF, see what he has to say about who's fighting for justice for Oakley and who's to blame for not taking care of this little girl. The whole concept of this reorganization is to have more prevention to prevent tragedies so we have to have less reaction. We, we need to get ahead of these problems and when you have a department which is dedicated to preventing these tragedies, you're going to have less tragedies. I'm convinced of that. That was Governor Jay Inslee speaking in 2016 before his blue ribbon panel came back with the suggestion to roll up several different agencies into one large agency. That includes Child Protective Services, Foster Care, Family Assessment Response, and Early Childhood Education. In July 2017, the governor signed a law creating the Department of Children, Youth, and Families to do just that, and appointed Ross Hunter, a former Microsoft executive and state legislator, as secretary. Two years later, oversight of juvenile rehabilitation and detention services were added to the agency. This week, I sat down with Secretary Hunter. Have you been to Grace Harbor County, drive through Thurston County, through Fife, and seen all the Oakley Carlson billboards that are up? I have. Uh, we have tried to get information from your office mm -hmm. about whether anybody went and saw her parents mm -hmm. um, through the entire year where nobody had seen her, drug test them, just see if she's doing okay. And we have been stonewalled, the agency, your agency, yep. telling us that because of the privacy laws, mm -hmm they're not going to respond. That's correct. That's what they're saying, and I'm going to say the same thing here. Yeah, but it's a legal gray area because just because she's not declared dead, you know, who is who is advocating for Oakley? Who, who is answering the questions well, about how, what, how Oakley was protected? Um, we have a number of ways that people can look at, uh, at child welfare records. Um, and when there's an active criminal investigation, uh, we are usually uh, advised by the, asked by both our attorney generals and by the investigating law enforcement agency to not interfere in their investigation. But, but you have two parents in jail, but yet your office can't tell us that they are, that, and the other two kids had meth. One ingested meth, the two-year-old, the six-year-old had so, meth in their hair. Why can't you tell us whether an agent went and talked to the family I, or tested I, the family? Because, because the attorney general tells me that I, can't violate the privacy rights of that child or that family. Um, and that's the, that's the nature of this. And these interviews are really uncomfortable. Yeah. Does that need to be changed then? Do we need an Oakley's Law? Do we need, we, do we need something to answer this gray area? Because this is, it is an unusual so, case, I get that. But um, you know, what if she's never found? Will we never know what your office did? I can't answer the legal question on that. I don't know, I'm not a lawyer. Um, 
The, do you need a different thing? Again, you got a trade off here. Do you want to live in a state where uh, someone can weaponize the CPS system, uh, can start releasing information about CPS investigations, whether they do or don't find anything? Uh, I don't think so. So I, the legislature makes that choice. A law enforcement source told me that it seemed like DCYF sure closed ranks on this quickly because maybe you guys didn't do anything. Maybe you didn't go check on the parents and see if they were using drugs again. Is there any truth to that? So, um, I think I just answered that question in that I don't think I can talk specifically about this case. Yeah. Um, and I can give you the same answer over and over again. I don't think that will be very satisfying for you. Um, no, I don't think anybody's satisfied. We all right. want to know. We want to know where Oakley is, right? Nobody's yeah, satisfied. We all we, want to know where yeah, Oakley right, is. Right, right, right. But we also, we also want to know that there's not going to be another Oakley, and that uh, kids are not being returned to parents who are going to relapse because they have a methamphetamine addiction, knowing what steps were taken to make sure that those parents mm -hmm. deserve to have their kids back. They clearly didn't deserve to have their kids back. Your office tested the other two kids in December. The two-year-old had. Uh, more methamphetamine in their system than your uh, charts could even register when they did the tests. So that means the two-year-old was ingesting methamphetamine and the six-year-old girl, the sister, had it in her hair, meaning she was around it. So these were parents so, that were using drugs around the uh, kids that were returned to them. I, I'm not allowed to comment on the details of individual okay. cases. I understand. I, 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 I understand the legal I, part I, I of it. Uh, the foster mom said that she had made some calls about right. things she was concerned about was, and we, we just can't verify anything because of the privacy laws, because there's not a death investigation. We can't verify whether there was an investigation followed up. You know, maybe someday you and I could sit down and talk about right. this if they do find her body or there is, right. and, and it will become more clear. I get, the bottom line is you're not trying to hide the information because you think anything was done wrong. You just legally cannot release I it. I cannot release the information. What advice do you have for people who want to report a child abuse case? What should they say to the call taker specifically so that there is a report open and follow up? Um, if they actually w have witnessing abuse, they should tell us what, what they've actually seen. They should tell us the facts. Uh, they should describe it, it. In very few cases will someone actually witness the abuse happening. They'll see the after effects. You should report if you have a uh, child has unexplained bruises uh, or regular bruises, whether there's an explanation or not. You, you, you want to report that. What we'd like people to not report is, wow, this, like, this kid comes to school dirty every day. Is there a checklist of terms that the call takers use? Because I had heard that if you just report, I think the kid has a black eye, maybe that's not specific enough. Are there certain things that you look for that sort of automatically we, trigger We look for them to, to meet the definition of potential child abuse. And we get enough calls on that that uh, we do 40,000 of these investigations a year. So um, I need people to report the facts that they've seen, and I, I don't want to give them a secret prescription to send a... CPS worker out there. Next, our investigation uncovers accusations of a culture of fear and intimidation at DCYF, where social workers are pushed to the brink. After the DCYF denied our request for public records in Oakley's case, we started looking for whistleblowers. And what we found is a culture of fear and intimidation. Employees on the brink of stressing out. People who really want to help kids and do the best for the children in our community who just can't do the job because of a lack of resources or pressures from above. We did find three people willing to talk to us, but because of threats against their livelihood, two of those women backed out. A third, though, a former DCYF supervisor, did agree to speak with Hannah Kim. A former employee who knows the ins and outs of the state's foster care system going on the record with the spotlight. I was a CFWS social worker, which means that I worked with the kids that were in foster care, families that were in the court system. CFWS stands for Child and Family Welfare Services, which is under DCYF. Melanie worked there for 13 years, last half of that as a CFWS supervisor before she chose to walk away last year. Turnover is insane. Some workers maybe last a year um, just because it's, it's an impossible job 
and, um, and the stress is really, really high. I know workers that have 25 plus kids on their caseload. Um, and for people who don't understand what that means, why is 25 a lot? A CFWS social worker should have a max of 18 children on their caseload. I can tell you I've never known anybody to have only 18 kids on their caseload. That 18 caseload is state law. Melanie says CFWS social workers have to make at least one home visit per month, an average case lasting two years. They are showing Olympia that if we had all the positions filled, then the cases would average 18 per worker. But like I said, in all the years that I worked there, um, the positions have never been filled. Melanie says the burnout made even worse by a lack of support from top managers of her branch. Come downstairs and see the work that we're doing. See the stress that we're under. Never, never did that happen. Despite me being there and being a huge part of that team, I could never remember my name. Um, that was just humiliating. I don't, I don't, I didn't never understood that. From humiliation to trauma, back in 2012, Melanie says she was pregnant in her third trimester when she lost her baby. In my seventh month, I lost the baby. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so the baby died. I even remember being at work and not feeling my baby. And so I ended up going to the hospital. So stressed about her cases, Melanie says she took two weeks off instead of maternity leave. Management didn't check in on me. Nobody said, hey, maybe you shouldn't be back at work. But I felt because of that pressure, I needed to be back for a termination trial. And that's insane. That's insane. So that's how I feel like a lot of workers feel. She is compelled to speak up because no matter how hard someone works, no matter how passionate they are, the heavy workload she believes is leading to mistakes. There's no way to do that job 100% correct when you're overworked, you're denied over time, <laughs> you feel you can't take a vacation because you're just going to have double the work when you come back. So yes, I'm sure mis mistakes are made every day. What is the solution to that then? There were some supervisors that could keep people, that could keep a unit. Um, you know, I'm not trying to brag, but I didn't have people leave my unit very often. And there were other, work, other supervisors that didn't have workers leave. So why doesn't management look at that? What are the qualities? Why are workers staying for these particular supervisors? And how can we cultivate that? How can we duplicate that? This whistleblower says every day social workers are making a difference, keeping vulnerable children safe. The public rarely hears about those countless stories, but they do find out when a child dies or goes missing. It's life or death choices. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just very, very high stress. <laughs> There's always the stress of knowing that your mistake or a lack of just knowing all the facts could end up on the news. It's always in the back of your mind. Here is one more look at little Oakley Carlson's sweet smile. If you recall anything at all about seeing her or Andrew Carlson or Jordan Bowers, please contact the Grace Harbor County Sheriff's Office. Or if you want to stay anonymous, you can submit a tip to Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS. All of the people in Grace Harbor County have come together. They are raising money all the time, and the cash reward is now more than $25,000 if you can help find Oakley. Since 2017, there have been 68 fatality reports sent to legislators about kids in the care of DCYF who died. There are no reports about Oakley sent to legislators because her case has not been ruled a death. So right now, we can't get any information from DCYF. We are stonewalled. What do you think about that? Do you work for DCYF? Do you have experiences you want to share? Reach out to the spotlight at fox.com. That's our email. To see a link to all of those reports, we'll put them in this story at fox13seattle.com.
That's all the time we have for now. Be smart and stay safe.